once again, it is a genuine privilege and delight to be with you this evening. I'm thankful for the presence of each and every one. I mentioned that there are visitors in our audience, and we're thankful for your presence. But I'm thankful for the presence of the members here. I know that you could choose to be doing other things. You've selected to be here, and that shows your spirituality, your interest in things that pertain to God and His Word and His will. The things that worship Him from a perspective of us coming together to sing praise into His name, to have prayers led by individuals that acknowledge God as our Heavenly Father, that we can appeal to Him as His children for the things that we have need of in this life and know that He hears us and He cares for us. And as we think about those kinds of things, to ever keep in mind that we need to be God-centered in the things we do in this life. We've been looking at a number of lessons, all with a, framed in the uh, theme of God-centered, and also contrasting that with the idea of not being man-focused. Uh, we've looked at a number of lessons, and let me just take a moment to kind of review those, because I think it's important from a standpoint of what we're going to be looking at this evening to give some consideration to what we've already covered. Sunday morning during the Bible class, we looked at the Bible, and the Bible is God-centered. We then looked at our lives that are to be God-centered. We considered that evening, Sunday evening, our service, which is to be humble, serving God and serving each other. Monday night, we looked at the family, the physical family, and being God-centered as a family. We thought about Tuesday night, the idea of the church, and that's the spiritual family of God, and the church being God-centered. And then last night, we thought about decisions, the decisions we make, both as a congregation of the Lord's people and as it pertains to us personally, how we go about making the decisions that we make, and they need to be God-centered. And as we think about that, and what we tried to emphasize is not only the idea of God-centeredness, but how to accomplish that. We need to be able to go about those tasks in a way that is effective, that enables us to truly, genuinely be God-centered in our lives and the activities we engage in. And this evening, we're going to look at the idea of being tested. So the question is, well, how do I know if I'm God-centered in my life? How do I know if I'm being God-centered as it relates to my family? How do I know as part of my activities and interactions with those of the family of God, the church, that I'm God-centered? How can I evaluate that and ascertain whether that's not truly the case, whether I'm not genuinely going about being God-centered in my life and not man-focused. And so our interest this evening is to kind of evaluate that idea, to test. You know, testing is something we do routinely. Uh, those that are in school, you know you're tested. Uh, you have information and material that's given to you, and you're supposed to study that material. And so in order to evaluate whether or not you comprehend it, there is a test that is given. So you can evaluate whether or not you've learned those things. <laughs> There are tests that are performed in various ways to ascertain what point we've gained some understanding or comprehension. And maybe even in workplace, there's some tests that may be performed in order to make sure that somebody understands what they're doing and that they comprehend how to accomplish those matters and relate to their workplace. And so testing is a natural, normal thing. You might notice on the graphic here, I'll just make an observation. Uh, this is Abraham and Isaac, and we'll be talking about Abraham and Isaac. And I, I think you wouldn't be surprised that that would be part of what we're going to be considering this evening when we think about being tested. We find that God does test us. The affirmation we make and what we're going to find in Scripture is that God tests us. We're going to be tested in life. And that's just a fact that we need to acknowledge and then to understand the purpose behind being tested and how we can then evaluate our lives based upon these tests that come our way. I have one verse of scripture that I want to use to start as an introduction. I think it capsulizes the idea, both from a standpoint of the theme and also the particular lesson we're examining this evening. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, as Paul writes, he says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Now I said this takes care of both the theme and also then it looks at it from a standpoint of the specific lesson. And the theme about being God-centered and not man-focused, well, we have it here, the statement made, not pleasing men, he goes about the task and the proclamation of the gospel, not to please men, but God. He's God-focused. He's not looking at the idea of man as being that which motivates him or the idea of pleasing men, but to acknowledge God and to please him. And then the second point that we have there, because God tests our hearts. 
That's an affirmation. He says that's going to happen. That's inevitable as it relates to our lives. We're going to be tested in various ways, and Paul acknowledges that in this writing. So with those thoughts in mind, let's look at some ideas. First of all, I want to talk about the distinction between tested and tempted. And I think it's imperative that we appreciate that there is a differentiation between these two ideas. And when we think about tempted, Satan tempts us. He's the tempter. He intends for us to fail. He wants us to sin. That's his objective. That's his goal. He lures us with temptations to draw us in, to cause us to sin against God and be separated from him. We can turn over, for example, to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and looking at just the first three verses, the, you can go further in that text. Of course, you'll recognize that immediately as the occasion in which Jesus goes up and for 40 days he is fasting and, and prayer. And then the tempter, the devil, comes to him to tempt him. That's the terminology that's used in those verses. He comes to tempt Jesus. He wants Jesus to fail. He wants Jesus to sin. And so here he is going and approaching Jesus with that intent and purpose in mind. Now, one of the things about Satan, Satan is a real entity. He really exists. I know that some people have argued, well, that's just a personification of evil, and that evil is described as Satan, and therefore you can kind of consider evil in this way, and so it's, it's helpful to kind of reflect upon evil in this manner, and so it takes on the characteristics of a human being, uh, the evil is inanimate, but nonetheless it takes on these characteristics. And we do find that the scriptures use personification to help teach things. You can go, for example, over to Proverbs in the first few chapters there, and wisdom is referred to as this uh, woman that is desirable. You need wisdom and because wisdom provides so much for us. So there's a personification that's noted as it relates to wisdom. You can go to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and there you can read about love and the personification of love, the characteristics of love, and, and giving these human characteristics to show and demonstrate the appeal that we ought to have and, and what love really consists of. And so there are instances in the Bible of personification, but Satan is not a personification of evil. Satan is real. And this verse illustrates that irrefutably. And the reason why is because when Jesus is being tempted, is this an external temptation? Is something outside of him tempting him? Or is this something in his mind? He's wrestling with something. You know, evil within him to try to decide whether I'm going to do this or go that way or the temptations that are brought before him. Well, we recognize it's not within Jesus. It's not, it's not this idea that he's wrestling and struggling with these things and trying to decide whether to turn those stones to bread. Brother Satan says, I, I've come to you. you you're, you're hungry and, and, and you just go ahead and you turn those stones to bread. You'll prove conclusively who you are. That's the kind of uh, effort that was made on Satan's part to tempt Jesus. So Satan was a real entity. He's genuinely seeking whom he may devour. He's like that roaring lion. He's constantly in pursuit of us to cause us to be tempted, to be lured by the things he places before us, to cause us to sin and be separated from God. That's temptation. And the source of that temptation is Satan. Well, testing. God tests us. Now, as we'll go through the study, and you'll notice this as we kind of develop certain points, but at the conclusion, we're going to look at it explicitly and how that's done. But God does test us. It's inevitable. But he desires us to succeed, thus to be approved. So the distinction is the source of the temptation, Satan, and the source of the testing, God, and the outcome, the desired outcome. And that is Satan's desire for us to fail and God's desire for us to go about and accomplish those things and be approved. Now, I'm going to make a passing reference. I've already noted that in that little graphic we had with Abraham and Isaac, we're going to be looking at Genesis 22nd chapter later in our study as we go through the various parts of it. But if you note just immediately toward the conclusion of what's described there, of Abraham being instructed to take Isaac, his son, and sacrifice him. The, the verse to show and demonstrate God's desired end is seen here in this verse. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So here was one that was approved 
the testing that was done of God demonstrated the faithfulness and that he feared God. He had that reverential respect for God above everything and everyone, including, in this case, his son. Again, we'll elaborate upon that more extensively. It's a fascinating study that we can look at and help us understand this concept of testing. But I think it's particularly effective to first start by noting the intended purpose. We see the outcome, but what did God desire and what did God want to come from this? And we see what transpired. Now, let's notice this then. Why are we tested? Just kind of go through several reasons why we're tested and think about this. And again, if you have your Bibles or electronic devices or you're over there in Genesis 22, just hang on to those verses with, with me for a few moments. We're going to be considering this. First of all, it proves our faith. We're tested to prove our faith. And so as you look at this, and as I said, hang on to Genesis 22, but first let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, this chapter of faith. These heroes of faith, these individuals that demonstrated faith in their life. One of the things that we note, and correctly so, is that faith is demonstrated by our actions. That the only way I can prove my faith is by doing what I've been instructed to do. In every one of these instances, as you go through Hebrews chapter 11, what was the thing that demonstrated or showed the faith of these individuals? They did what they were instructed to do. And so faith is active. Faith is not just simply taking an intellectual understanding and saying, I believe in God, I, I recognize there's a God, I acknowledge Him or the Lord Jesus. It moves us to do. And that's what is shown and what we find revealed here in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, these verses here, picking up there in verse 17, we read about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, In Isaac our seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So here's Abraham. Now we're going to make reference to Genesis, the 22nd chapter, but this is referring to that event that's recorded in Genesis 22. Abraham had such faith that when he was tested and God instructed him, he went about doing what God told him to do without hesitation, without doubt or questioning. Kind of impressive when you think about it and look at it. And the reason why is because he had this faith in God that he was still going to accomplish everything he said he would do through Isaac. And because he had that faith, he was not fearful of the out, ultimate outcome. Now, let me talk just briefly about faith as, as we think about this idea of faith a little bit more. Uh, and then consider Genesis 22 in light of what we just read. Sometimes people have this idea that, you know, I believe the Bible. And because I'm just convinced it's true in the sense that because I say it's, it's from God and therefore that's adequate and that's sufficient. And we think that discounting the idea of evidence and that we don't really need evidence to substantiate the scriptures. Now, let me point out something. The Bible gives us evidence. There's numerous instances in which we can take and look at the Bible, the scriptures, and be reassured that this is truly the mind of God revealed to us. One illustration of that, and this is internal, you can look at external things as well, but internally, think about the prophecies of old and their fulfillment. What happens in Acts chapter 2? When you have Peter, the apostle, standing up there preaching, you have Peter's sermon recorded by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what does he do? He's going to prove that Jesus is the Christ, that Messiah that had been foretold of in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of it in the New Testament. So he quotes Scripture. He uses this as evidence to substantiate the point. So you look then at the fulfilled prophecies. And that gives us reassurance that this has to be the mind of God revealed to us. No man could have predicted these things back here and see them fulfilled over here. Only God could have revealed that. Only God could have provided that. And a strong evidence to help people believe that the Bible is really the mind of God revealed to us is going through and look at those prophecies. Both when they were, were recorded of old and when we see them fulfilled in the New Testament. Now, as I said, some people think, well, I just have faith, and I have such great and grand faith that I don't need evidences. I just accept it at face value. And some think that their children, sometimes they, they have 
the disposition, their children leave their home, they go off to some place like a college, and suddenly their faith is shaken. They begin to be then introduced to varying ideas. And there are these skeptics that question the Bible and question what's taking place, and, and, and they really aren't rooted. They, they're not grounded themselves. They haven't really taken the time to delve into it and be reassured of the truths of the book. And we seem to think that we have this strong faith even by not having to need evidences. Well, let me ask you this question. What's the difference between that and, say, you're talking to an individual who's a Mormon, a member of the Church of the Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints? And if you're talking to them, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, the young men who are nicely dressed come to the door, they knock on the door, they begin to talk to you. And, and they, they talk about things, current events perhaps, something that they want to get your interest, and they begin to discuss these things. And then they have that Book of Mormon. And what is it that they're going to appeal to you to believe in the Book of Mormon? Well, you just pray about it. God's going to reveal this to you in some way. We don't know how. It's individualized in that respect. But you pray about it, God's going to reveal this to you, and you're going to know that the Book of Mormon is true. We reject that, don't we? What do we want from them? What, what are they going to have to do in order to prove to us that this is God's word? Well, they're going to have to provide evidence, aren't they? I can give some examples and illustrations of conversations I've had with some of these individuals. One of the situations in which we got into it, and I was talking to them, and I wanted the evidence, and I said, I happen to know some material and information about this, and let's look at these things. And, and when saying about praying about it, I said, that's not adequate. I, we need evidence to substantiate this. I can't just accept it at face value. I need something that is going to demonstrate that this is God's will revealed to us. And the person immediately said, well, isn't that the way you take the Bible? I said, no, no, I'll, I'll be glad for us to look at the evidence of the Bible, to look at the information that shows us that this has to be the mind of God revealed to us. Man could not have produced the scriptures. Man could not have made the prophecies of old about Jesus and see their fulfillment completely and fully over here in the New Testament. You can't see the prophecies that have to do with even the enemies of Jesus fulfilling their role in the New Testament. Every single prophecy was fulfilled. Now, we can go through and we can look at the evidence, internal, external evidence. So what's the difference, I ask you, if we take the approach that just accepting the Bible, looking at the Bible, is any different, I mean, without being reassured of the evidence, that, that any different than that that has to do with those individuals who uphold the Book of Mormon? Okay, so now, what does faith do for us then? If, if I can go back and say that we can substantiate it with evidence, so what's the idea of faith? Because the, the concept of faith, well, if I know that this is my, God's mind, where, where's my faith? Here's where the faith is. And let me ask you this question to kind of help see the point. Did Abraham know there was a God? Well, sure he knew there was a God. God talked to him. God communicated to him. So he had that knowledge. He knew there was a God, irrefutably. So if he knew there was a God, what was the faith? The faith is this. When knowing that the God exists, God speaks to us today in the Bible, but speaking to Abraham in this case, and he says to Abraham, you're going to take your son, Isaac, the son of promise, not just any son. I mean, I can't even fathom being asked to take my son, one of my sons, and go and sacrifice my son. That would be hard and difficult if God told me to do that. But please be impressed with something here. This is not just any son. This was the son of promise. It was through that seed that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. There were all these promises associated with this. So the faith that Abraham had, as revealed in Hebrews 11, as illustrated back in Genesis 22, is that when God told him to do it, he didn't waver. He didn't hesitate. He didn't understand how God was going to do it. He didn't recognize uh, from perspective of man's ability to reason, rationally consider all the different options that might be out there, that how is God going to fulfill his promises through his son Isaac when he's sacrificed and he's dead? What did Abraham do? God will take care of that. I know there's a God. God says he's going to do this. He, God always fulfills his promises. I don't know how God is going to accomplish that. It's not logical. It's not reasonable to me. But because God said to do it, I'm going to do it. That's faith. Faith moves us to do things when we don't understand, when we don't recognize, when it even might seem detrimental to us. We still are moved by faith. That's faith. 
So the evidence convinces us there's a God. The evidence convinces us that the Bible is his word. And we know that we live in the, under the New Testament, so it's that New Testament that's revealed to us as we study it and recognize the things we're to do that we go to it, and if faith moves us to do those things that we're told to do. So here's Abraham. He's told, and he's tested. And the old King James, unfortunately, uses the term tempted. The new King James, other translations correctly describe it as tested. And so you look, just as we found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19, we find that in the 22nd chapter, that it starts with this idea, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to Abraham, and he said to Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then he goes on and tells him, you take your son Isaac and go sacrifice for me. You read about that, Abraham, the next day he got everything gathered, he had everything prepared, and there they go. They're taking off to go where he was told to go in order to sacrifice his son. He didn't question, he didn't argue, he simply obeyed. He had that faith. There's a lot of interesting things attached to this as you continue to go through it. You see they're going along and the journey that takes place and then tells the servant to wait and that he, that they would come back. There's a reference to the idea that they would come back. So the faith, Abraham knew that Isaac was going to return with him. Uh, as, as recorded there, Abraham understood, even though he was prepared to sacrifice him, that they were going to return. We'll come back to you. And they're going along, and I just, it's hard for me to even fathom and heart-rending to consider the idea that as they're going along, and Abraham, Abraham's taking his son, and Isaac looks around and says, you know, we have all the things we need here to accomplish this, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. That was the answer, the totality of it. And they go on, and Abraham was ready and prepared to strike the death blow and sacrifice his son when his hand was stayed. Now, I know you fear me. You're not going to, as he's spoken to, as the Lord expresses these things, I know you fear me above everything because you don't withhold anything, not even your only begotten son. It's impressive, is it not? And it proves our faith. When we're tested, our faith is going to be proved, or at least we have the op opportunity to show that we have that kind of faith that causes us to do what God tells us to do. I want to look at one other instance that I think is also helpful for us to appreciate this idea over in Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. We're going to read a few verses here. And notice as it, as it relates to the Israelites as, as a whole and uh, the time period of the wanderings in which their, Moses had led them out of captivity by the hand of God and they're going about the wandering there's some things that perhaps we might overlook if we don't look and see things uh, more carefully and scrutinize it more exactly and that's the case in this instance because the time period of these things going on what was taking place well we find in these verses what God was doing in verse 1 of chapter 8 of Deuteronomy Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as, man, as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Now what was taking place? They were going about and God tested them. Part of that test is he allowed them to go hungry. He was going to take care of them, but the test was, do you have confidence that I'll take care of you? You, you know how they failed the test? They murmured and they complained. You see, what they should have done is to go before God and say, God, we, we have this need, and to humbly request this, to put their trust and confidence in God. Instead, they grumbled, they complained. They blamed Moses, they blamed God, 
they were dissatisfied with their lot and their predicament. They looked back to Egypt, as horrendous as that was, and the slavery which they were in. They said, we at least have food there. There were several occasions which they wanted to go back. Let's just get us another leader and let's return to that slavery. It's hard for us to fathom, I know, but if you consider the situation, circumstance, and place ourselves in their predicament, how would we have responded? I hope and pray and trust that maybe we, through uh, our understanding and comprehension of these matters, wouldn't have reacted the way they did. We would hope that would be the case, wouldn't we? And yet I must confess that I, looking at them and their situation, I may have just gone right along with them. <laughs> I may have murmured and complained and done the same thing. What, would I have been able to be approved? Would I, in testing, would I have had the right disposition of heart? and behaved in the right way? That's the question we need to ask ourselves, and part of what we can do is to look at ourselves today and see if what we do and how we go about the tasks we engage in, if, if we have the right mentality to begin with. When we're not even in the predicament that they ha are in, yet do we complain and murmur about things and how it ought to be, rather than being appreciative of what we have and praying to God to see to us and bless us and care for us? You know, we're an affluent society. And the prayer that was uttered talked about that. How blessed we are. How much we have. Do you know there's a danger in that in itself? That we've become self-sufficient and we've become complacent and satisfied instead of turning and putting our trust in God and instead of turning to Him and, and really understanding that, that as we go through life, this idea that I am nothing without Him, that everything I have is because of Him, that's true physically, but more importantly, it's absolutely true spiritually. Being God-centered. And I think it's profitable to us as we think about these incidences that are recorded in Scripture to kind of think about how would I have responded. To kind of evaluate this and then consider, am I of that disposition even now, under the circumstances in which I live? Do I have the kind of faith that I need to have when I am tested Am I approved? Do I pass the test? Not flunk? It proves our faith when we're tested. It also, and this kind of builds on this, strengthens us spiritually. When we pass the test, it strengthens us spiritually. The, the uh, inevitable consequences is that I'm going to be stronger when I have humbly done what the Lord said when I go about and am faithful in His instructions that are given to me. Now, I've got a couple of verses of Scripture here on the board that we're going to take note of. Uh, I wanted to first look at the 66th Psalm, and there in verse 10, because I want this verse to kind of be used then to Look at the other verses. It kind of lays the foundation and the groundwork. So Psalm 66 and verse 10 reads, For you, O God, have tested us. So the psalm says you've tested us. Again, we're going to see that that's inevitable, that testing is a part of what takes place. It goes on, you have tested us. You've refined us as silver is refined. Now you think about refining and silver. You know uh, silver is taken and the ore there, and, and you take it, and when it says it's refined, it's taken and things are done to it in order to take out the impurities, those things that are not wanted or desirable, so that the silver itself comes out in its pure form. Uh, you think about instances where any kind of metal is going to be taken and that metal is in the ore, and so there's some refining that is done. There's methods and means that are used in heating it up, for example, in order to be able to take that and extract the ore uh, away from the metal that you're seeking and desiring to have. And the fire is applied, the heat is applied, and it's done this way. And, and there are two things that transpire, potentially, as it relates to this type of a process. One is purifying and removing the impurities from that which you're desirous to have, that precious metal. The other is strengthening tempers it, makes it stronger. So you think about the process that may go through in order to take iron and you pro provide it, the forging of it, in order to come out with it something that's strong, durable. And so the idea of this 
testing that is done is it purifies and it strengthens. As we go through these things, as we go through whatever tasks that are before us, as we go through the difficulties of life, the desired end is that as we go through these particular circumstances that we're confronted with, that when we're all said and done, we're going to be pure and strengthened. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, and we're going to, again, note just a couple of verses to build upon this thought, this idea. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and notice with me there in verses 6 and 7, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if indeed, uh, if indeed be, you have been grieved by various trials, <clears throat> that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says this here, here for a little while, even though you go or grieve by various trials, these trials that come upon you in life, these difficulties that you have to encounter. And he says what these difficulties do as you go through them, the genuineness of your faith, and, and he compares that with the idea of gold, and physical gold, and how much more precious is your faith how much more is it as it relates to the spirituality rather than the physical realm that you go through these particular things and you're tested by fire. And when you come through that testing, when you come through to the other end, when you have remained faithful in the face of all these difficulties and problems that you may confront, the challenges that are needing to be met day by day, that when you're completely through that particular difficulty, you come out and you're tried and you're strengthened. <laughs> It, it, it results in this idea that one has gone through all these challenges and difficulties, and as they come out, they're made stronger as a result of this. Not necessarily a pleasant thing to go through it, but the end result is that you're better as a consequence of it. I think about different situations in which sometimes you go to the doctor. You know, Bo, <laughs> go to the doctor. That's not necessarily a pleasant thing. You have the circumstance, but you know there's, a, there's this problem and stuff, and you might have to go through some things in order to come out the other end, so you're whole and made better. I'll, I'll share something with you, but you can't tell anybody, okay? So it's just between us, among us. I have a phobia about needles. I, I just really have a real tough time with needles. I go through, I've, I've learned to kind of how to deal with that. I know it's uh, absurd, it's ridiculous. I used to say I'm just going to be really tough it out and everything, and that never worked out too well. So I go through and I have sort of a calming technique that I've learned to use to go through the process a little bit of these things. And one of the things I do is I go and I tell the person that's going to be taking my blood or whatever they're going to be doing to me, where this needle is going to be poked into me. I said, I have this thing about needles. I just want you to know that. And they're always appreciative of it, incidentally, because they don't want me to have some kind of a problem and, and a difficulty. So they, they're all, and, and by the way, if you have two people that are taking blood, one is a lady and the other is a guy, Go to the lady. Ladies are so much more compassionate. It's, I just tell you, my experience has been, so I'm going to share that with you. So you go through this situation, and they're going to draw the blood, and so the, usually the ladies, oh, oh, that's fine, and they just talk to me, and they're so calming and so sweet and pleasant, and so we get it done, and I'm talking to them. We get done. We're all, we're all finished. Well, you know something? It's not a pleasant thing for me. I mean, it's not pleasant for anybody, I'm sure, but for some people, when you have these kinds of circumstances, it's something that's kind of a little more challenging. But you know something? Going through it, when it's all said and done, be able to get the information that's needed in order to make sure I'm healthy and I'm doing things I need to do, or if there's something that needs to be done for me that is taken care of. The point is, in life, there are challenges we have. There are difficulties and, and struggles that we have to go through. These struggles that we have. Yet when we face them rightly and correctly, when we go about remaining faithful in front of and in whatever thing we have to contend with, when we come through, we are stronger. An inevitable consequence of that is our spirituality is stronger. And we're even able to face things more that come before us. We're able to have dealt with those things rightly because the Lord gives us the ability to accomplish these things. And the result is that I'm stronger. Turn with me over to James, the first chapter. In James chapter 1, and, and again, just kind of following up with what we saw here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, in the first chapter of James, and picking up in verse 2, you could continue to read from that point, but these verses sort of 
hone in on the points that we want to look at. My brother counted all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Do you realize that there are some things that have to be done when I'm tested? If I'm going to have patience, that long-suffering, that what that's going to do is certain things are going to come my way that are going to be hard, and they're going to be difficult, and they're going to cause me to struggle. But if I'm going to be perfect, that is complete or full, I've got to go through those testing and come out approved, and then I've learned this process of what it means to be long-suffering. I can't have patience that's long-suffering without having to experience it. And that's the point. These things of life that come upon us is how we deal with them, how we cope with them. And the Word of God provides us with the information that tells us how to deal with it rightly and correctly and appropriately. We have various ones in the Bible examples of those who went through all kinds of struggles and problems and did so in a way that they come out as approved. We're going to talk tomorrow night about Job. We're going to look at Job as part of our study tomorrow evening. But when you think about Job, or I should say that you need to kind of look at it uh, as thinking about Job. Actually, we're going to be looking at Job now as an example for others and this idea of Job as an example for others. In James, the fifth chapter, and in verses 10 and following, I want to look at this idea that strengthens us, we're approved as a result of our faith, and then the example that we have for other people, or others' example for us. And in this instance, you have Job under consideration. There in the 10th verse of the 5th chapter, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Remember, we talked about this going through and how do we have patience or long-suffering, how do we uh, able to have that as part of our characteristic of life, well, it goes through these trials and suffering that we have. So as you look here, it says, now, here's Job, uh, these prophets, and then the suffering of patience in verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So here's the Job and his situation that we read about in the book of Job and what he had to confront, all the challenges he had. And I'm humbled by looking at his life and what he had to contend with and how he dealt with that. When we start thinking about Job, the first thing that happens, because Satan is desirous of tempting Job to sin, that he goes before God. And God says, have you noticed my servant Job, what a righteous individual he is? And Satan says, well, no wonder. You give him everything he could possibly want. You put a hedge around him. You protect him. Now, if you allow me to touch him, if you allow me to take away from him some things that he values, then he'll curse you. And so God permitted it. He allowed Satan then to, first of all, take all of his worldly possessions and his children. He left the wife and the wife because she... <clears throat> the wife because she was not going to be an asset to him, unfortunately, and that she would actually be a detriment in trying to encourage him to go ahead and curse God and die. But he goes through these ordeals. And as Job goes through these ordeals, what's the consequence of this? He says, well, first of all, that as it relates, God giveth and God taketh away, blessed be the name of God. Should we accept that which is good from him and not adversity? In each instance, he goes ahead and he deals with this in a way that acknowledges God. He's being God-centered. And I, it, again, it's hard to fathom all that he had to endure. And he doesn't have as much information as we ex have today, including Job's own example for us. So here's Job going through all of this situation. And what does the Scriptures tell us about this? It says, look at Job. Consider Job, the example of Job. And consider the graciousness and mercy of God. Because in the final analysis, God blesses Job far more than what he had before. So one of the things that helps us endure, one of the things that helps us to overcome when the, we have problems and challenges, whether it be health, monetary, when we start looking at situations that might cause us to begin to have uh, problems uh, in relation to our spirituality and when we're trying to put God first and we begin to go through these types of struggles, what helps us is to always keep in mind that God's made provisions for us. He's given us blessings. And even if we go through, and Job being that example, that God blessed him more at the end than at the beginning, he's going to bless us more at the end than the beginning. 
that's an absolute fact. He will bless us more at the end than the beginning. Somebody says, well, what do you mean? Like, Joe, if I go through these problems and difficulties at the end of this, maintaining my spirituality, continuing to serve the Lord faithfully, putting him first above everything and everyone, that I'm God-centered, that I'm going to have more in this physical life than I had at the outset, uh, at the beginning of it? No, that's not the promise. The blessing we have is eternal life, that heavenly home. That's far more precious and great than anything this world has to offer. And we think about Revelation 2, verse 10. Remain faithful in death and you shall receive that crown of righteousness. What is it in this life that's so precious to me that I will forfeit eternal life? What sacrifices would I be unwilling to make in this life in exchange for that heavenly home? Job's example is the graciousness of God demonstrated, his mercy that's shown. And that's what we can take to heart. And brethren and friends, be assured that in the final analysis, what we have in Christ far exceeds anything that this world has to offer. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, in verses, in the second chapter, verses 20 through 24, <clears throat> we notice there. Jesus' example for us. And we talk about the example and the perfect example, that example for us that tells us how we need to act under all circumstances and situations, even in adversity and difficulties of life. And the, there we notice, picking up in, in uh, verse 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable, before God. So if, if, if something happens to me because of my fault, I'm not doing right, and, and I take that patiently, well, I'm just getting what I justly deserve. So what the scriptures are saying, and as Peter writes these things, he's talking about how we deal with those things when things are unjustly done toward us. One of the things I, I told my children when they were growing up, I, I wanted them to understand a principle. And this principle is this. Life is not fair. If you think life is going to be fair, that everything's going to be done rightly because I do all the things right and if I do it correctly that I'm going to be praised for that or I'm going to be promoted for that or I'm going to in some way receive something uh, uh, f uh, good from those things. And if you have that mentality, then the first thing that comes along in which things aren't that way, you become bitter and angry. Well, that's not the way it ought to be. Well, it's true, that's not the way it ought to be. But life is not fair. But the Bible tells me how to deal with that situation when life is not fair. And while life is not fair, God is always fair. He deals with us fairly because He cares for us. And as we go through life then, what we need to be appreciative of is, okay, if I'm not dealt with fairly, I'm going to still do what's right in spite of that. And if somebody treats me wrongfully, I'm going to still do what's right. That doesn't mean that I ignore sin or wrongdoing. It doesn't mean that I don't tell someone they're not doing what the Word of God has to say about the matter. But I'm still going to uphold my integrity. I'm still going to be faithful before the Lord. I'm not going to allow that to crush me under and cause me to be unfaithful. There's a lot of instances where I've come across individuals and they complain about somebody else and the reason why they're not doing what they ought to do because of this person or that person or some situation and, and it wasn't fair and it wasn't just. That may be absolutely true. But the reaction that they have separates them from God. And that's what is absolutely sad, destructive. In the final analysis, I'm going to have to give an account for my life. And nobody else is, whatever they've done to me, is going to cause me to be separated from my God. The only thing that separates me from my God is my own behavior and conduct. And I'm not going to allow anybody else to cause me to sin against God. That's got to be our disposition. I don't care how unfair anybody's treated you. You still got to do what's right because your soul is at stake. So Jesus sets forth this principle as you go through. First of all, as Peter acknowledged this idea, he talks about if you're beaten for your faults, and you do it patiently, what credit is that? But if, if you suffer wrongfully, that's commendable. It, it illustrates your disposition of heart. In verse 21, for this, 
For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered it for us. Leave us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was vowed, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. The greatest crime, most reprehensible act in the human history was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. People can look at all other kinds of things. You can set these things over here and say, oh, this is horrendous, this is terrible. There has been no greater crime perpetrated on the face of this earth than Jesus Christ being crucified upon the cross. He was perfectly, completely, and absolutely innocent. Do you realize nobody else can say that? You may be innocent of a crime. You may be falsely accused. You may suffer as a consequence of that. But you know something? I've not been sinless in my life. I've still done things that are wrong. Jesus Christ was absolutely sinless. He did no wrong of any sort or type, much less violated any law, civil or religious. And yet he died upon the cross, and he did so willingly. He went through that suffering for us so we can have a hope of eternal life. So when we look at his example, he tells us how we need to behave and to act regardless of what happens around us, whatever the situation may be. It enables us to look and see that I need to accept these things in a way that always honors God in my life and that I deal rightly with those around about me. No matter how badly they treat me, I am still to do what is right. So there's the example that's given. And let me notice something. How are we tested? We've already talked about this and, and considered it somewhat, but let me emphasize it. As we think about this, we're automatically tested when God commands. We either obey or we reject Him. That's the inevitableness of it. We automatically are tested. See, God's Word. I don't have to wonder how I'm tested. I know when I'm tested. God commands and I can either do it or I reject it. In Mark 16, 60, Jesus said, he commands, he says forth, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That statement that's made there that says forth, believe and is baptized shall be saved. I can either obey that or reject it. I'm tested on that basis. God wants me to be approved. God wants me to obey his instructions. The Lord gave those instructions and he wants me to follow that and adhere to it for my salvation. We think about Hebrews 5 and verse 9. In Hebrews 5 and verse 9 it talks about that Jesus had been perfected, the Christ was perfected, and thus he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. So he's the author of salvation, but I must obey him. And again, faith itself is active. It means I'm going to obey. Because I have faith, I'm going to do what he instructs me to do. And we need to test ourselves. You know, that's kind of an interesting proposition, to test ourselves. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, 13th chapter, I want to look at this with you and, and reflect upon this for just a few moments before we close this study because I think this is imperative. It's absolutely essential that we test ourselves to, to be able to know where we stand, whether we're right or wrong. And the scriptures inform us of the need for the testing and so that Paul writes to the Corinthian brethren and there in verse 5 of the 13th chapter, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. So examine yourself. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed you are disqualified? And so you examine yourself to test yourself, to evaluate yourself, to see if not, whether or not we're doing what's right. James, the first chapter, verse 22 through 25, kind of builds on that and, and describes this perfect law of liberty and looking at the perfect law of liberty and how people go and look in a mirror and you see yourself and you walk away and forget what manner of man you are. Thus it is sometimes, here's the perfect law of liberty, and do we look at it to, re, to reflect upon it, whether to see whether those things that are contained therein, I'm doing, and I, I'm following it. That remains a measure of how we test ourselves in order to ensure that we're doing what's right. So we test ourselves. There was a, a particular program a few years ago on the Civil War. Ken Burns did that, PBS. And... Uh, there was a statement that was made in the course of that that I thought was very fascinating. One of the narrators, one of the individuals they, they were interviewing, made this statement about Abraham Lincoln. He said Abraham Lincoln was a very intelligent man. and said that Abraham Lincoln was able to remove himself from himself 
and looked at himself. And that kind of struck me, you know, pretty strongly. That here was Abraham, he removed himself to look at himself, to evaluate himself, to see himself as others would see him. And, and so, so that evaluation took place. And what struck me about that is we as Christians need to remove ourselves from ourselves and look at ourselves, not just to see how others see us, but to see how God sees us, to see ourselves as God would see us, and to look in that perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, in order to see how we look from God's perspective. Do you realize that's really what we're trying to do is evaluate ourselves on the basis of God and His Word and His will in our lives? And if we're about that task of serving the Lord faithfully and correctly, if we test ourselves to ensure that we're doing what's right, we'll be approved by God. We'll be, be obedient to His Word. We'll follow His will in our lives completely, fully, without question, without doubt, without reservation. So as we think about this, let's consider it, examining ourselves as we're about to sing a song of encouragement and invitation. Am I right with the Lord? Do I stand justified and sanctified in His presence this very evening? Am I serving Him as I should? We need to be honest with ourselves, be objective about that. And to look in that perfect law of liberty and see if I am serving and following Him correctly, if my attitude and disposition of heart is right. And if it's not, what we need to do is make the changes in our lives that conform with His will so that we can be approved by Him. If you've yet to be baptized for the mission of your sins, you've yet to be, render obedience to Him. We encourage you to follow what the instructions of the Lord says and faithfully comply with it, to be baptized for the mission of sins, upon belief, repentance, and confession. If you've done that and there's in your life things that need to be changed or corrected, if there's sin in your life and you need to alter that, and if you need the prayers of the congregation, if you need to acknowledge that before your brethren so that they can pray for you and on your behalf, the Lord loves you so much He's made provision so you can be right with Him once again. Because the key is we want to make heaven our eternal abode. We can only do that if we stand before him justified, sanctified, and saved. And he's given us the means to accomplish that. Won't you take advantage of that? Won't you be right with him this very night if you're not at this point in time? By coming forward and making questions on us together, we stand and sing.